Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Winning Wimbledon show for Saturday. Uh, my name is Ramon Osa, and if you've been tuning in over the past two weeks, uh, you've seen a very lovely gentleman named Mark Jeffrey, who's my uh, partner, um, who has really held down the fort over the past couple of days while I was out gallivanting in Yosemite uh, with my family. And now Mark's in France uh, doing the same thing. So I want to give a huge shout out to Mark, huge shout out to Lenny uh, for everything that they've contributed uh, to this two week uh, run, which has just been so much fun for all of us. And thank you all for uh, tuning in and uh, asking your questions and uh, just supporting this whole process because this is our passion. This is what we love to do. So today, uh, we're talking about the 80-20 of the 80-20. And again, the 80-20 principle simply means that 20% of the things that you do are going to get you 80% of the results. And it's no different in tennis as it is in the roads that you take to work or the clothes that you wear every day. 20% of the things will get you 80% of the results. And if you remember a couple days ago, Mark and I uh, started to talk about the trust system. And the trust system stands for tactics, repetition, under pressure, self, and thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And this system was created uh, by Mark, actually, who uh, comes from the military, and found out that things were a lot more effective when you train everything at once. And the biggest challenge that we see with a lot of uh, tennis players is that they tend to train things in silos. They kind of work on their technique, and then they'll read a book on the mental game, and then they'll you know do the fitness, and then they'll you know, have a sports psychologist and all of these different facets are kind of disjointed. And so the aim of the trust system was really to bring everything together at once so that it became a linked skill that you could rely upon um, when you needed it the most, just like the military, because if they don't, they die. So we bring this element and a couple days ago, we talked about the T and the R, which was tactics and repetition. And if you haven't watched that episode, I totally recommend going back and looking at it because we really unpack the tactics and the two-shot combinations for you to train and then how to repeat them so that they become reliable and predictable. Um, and we really uncover that 80-20 and those small number of things that you can be doing that give you disproportionate results. And that's what we're all in the mood for because we're all pretty busy. We don't have four hours to train like these guys were watching on Saturday and Sunday. Um, so it's really, really good stuff. And today, what I'd like to do with you uh, is walk you through the U, the S, and the T. And if you remember, U stands for under pressure. And as we're watching Wimbledon, as you can imagine, in the championships, there's going to be a lot of pressure. And all things being equal... With similar strokes, similar tactics, similar fitness levels, whoever handles the pressure the best is going to win the match, more than likely. Especially since Brad Gilbert told us that 50% of the points are big points. And the more of those big points you win, aka the better you handle that moment and execute your training, the more likely you are to win the match. And it's no different from you. Uh, playing in your league or your uh, social Sunday doubles or national titles like we have in our uh, uh, community. And it's this learning about pressure and really what it is and how you can leverage it that's so important. So let's talk about pressure for a second. And pressure is a physiological response that we feel in our body. Um, in fact, I can remember playing my uh, intramurals in college with my love interest in the stands at the time. Uh, playing with my best friend in the world, Josh. We were in the championship round, and um, we had a chance to close out and really take the whole thing. And I'm serving at 40-15 at 5-4, and all of a sudden I get this thought in my head that you don't have a very good serve, you know? Like, it, they're probably going to attack this thing. And if you lose this match, that girl that's watching, you can forget about her. She's just going to walk right away. And all of a sudden I feel my knees start to shake, and I've, you know, I've got sweaty palms and I'm breathing really shallowly. And I double fault that point. Next point, I just patty cake a first serve in to hope that we can get a cheap and easy point. Josh gets nailed at the net. He turns around. He's pissed off, understandably. We go on to lose that game and we lose the match. We lose the entire thing. It's one of the worst losses of my career. Um, and again, I didn't play on the tour. I didn't play. I didn't even play college tennis. But I still remember that moment so vividly 
um, and it was very traumatic. And it was that pressure that sunk in that I didn't really understand. And I certainly was never training under pressure, which we'll get to in a second. But understanding what it is is so important because pressure actually gives you everything that you need from a physiological, biological perspective to perform at your best. If you think about it, back when we were cavemen and we were running uh, after saber-toothed tigers or running away from saber-toothed tigers, we had to have this kind of adrenaline that went through our body that made us see things so much sharper and be very acute with our hearing. And our senses would have to be heightened so that we could survive. And pressure gives us all of those things and more. The problem is, under pressure, under the hormones of stress, that information comes to us a lot faster, but it's, it's flawed information. And we actually get bits and pieces of it if we're not in the state of flow. And so pressure is actually your gateway into flow if you know how to use it. And so if you're not training under pressure, though, and you're like most people, you go out to the practice court, you hit a few balls around, you're loosey-goosey, you're joking around with your friends, um, and you're having a great hit, your technique feels amazing, and you know, you're hitting these unbelievable shots, you're really feeling your rhythm, that is a totally different environment than the finals of a USTA sectionals match or of the national championship rounds, who a couple of our players have been to. Um, or the semifinals of Wimbledon, who we've had a player that we've worked with. And so if you begin to train under pressure and you start to layer in different elements of pressure, and in fact, the trust system has nine layers of pressure. We can talk about a few of them. And you start to see yourself actually performing in those circumstances, a couple things happen. Number one, you're getting that constant sort of hit of pressure. And you're becoming more and more familiar with those feelings of pressure. And even though you can't exactly mimic what you have in a match court, especially if it's a deciding line of a, of a big match, then you're going to get to that point. And the only time that you really need pressure uh, or the ability to execute under pressure is the first time that you're experiencing it. Because in practice, you're in a totally different environment. So beginning to structure your training program so you actually have pressure and, you know, we can use targets, we can use scoring systems, we can use dynamic exercise in between uh, repetitions to mirror what you're going to have in a tennis match. And I could have a whole nother conversation about that. And you begin to use um, different rules and different stipulations of how you score points. And then you put an opponent um, on the same side or the opposite side of you that's also trying to score points. Now you're beginning to simulate that pressure and you're beginning to experience it more and more. And if you structure it correctly and it's progressive, what you see is a gradual shifting of your um, view of what pressure is and how you actually perform under it. So it's really, really important for um, your training, if you want to win more tennis matches, to begin to find ways to put pressure into your training. And again, if you're part of this community and you've joined the free uh, group, then you're going to be getting a lot of this stuff. And we have this also in our training programs that we'll be telling you about more later. Now, the S, as we move now to self and identity, uh, is really the glass ceiling of what you're capable of. And let's just define what self is and what identity is. Your identity is the collection of thoughts, beliefs, and actions that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis that sort of reflect what you think about yourself. So I'll tell you, in college, my identity was a non-athletic, um, probably untalented athlete um, that was just lucky to be on the tennis court with these guys. And deep down, I didn't really think that I was a winner, that I didn't really deserve to win, maybe, and not, not to go too deep, um, but there was some of that going on. And so your identity is really what is going to show up in the big moments. That's going to be that little voice that comes into your head right before you're about to serve on a big point that says, I got this, or better yet, you're not thinking at all, you're just on instinct. Um, or that says something else that's disempowering. Oh my God, here we go again. This is just like the last time where I blew it. 
What am I going to do now? God, nothing's working. And all of those thoughts are really just a memorized set of thoughts and emotions that shape your identity. And so something practical that you can do right away that you could do now is take out a piece of paper and just write down. If you had to give your current identity a name, um, what would it be? Would it be that of a clutch player or would it be of someone who tries really hard, um, who chokes, who, um, you know, is always unfortunate, always unlucky or, or whatever, and just decide, okay, that's the old me. And that's the way I used to think and feel about my tennis game up until now. Now, again, what I'm not saying is that this is all that you need to do is just close your eyes and meditate and you'll become a great tennis player. That's a very powerful thing to do, but we've also got to do the training. And we've talked about that in tactics and repetition. But it's also important to have a North Star of where you're going as an identity, as a player, um, so that you can now have this gap from where you are now to where you want to go. And now we can start to do training to move you along that gap and close that gap and become the new you. So if the new you is, let's say, a clutch player, someone who always plays his or her best when the situation requires it, that could be a new identity to train into. And as we start to uh, shift into thoughts, feelings, and emotions, just realize that your identity is nothing more than a story that you've told yourself over and over again up until now that maybe has become so real to you because you've said it so much that you don't realize that it's not the truth. And in fact, we can decide whatever we want to be true. I mean, you remember when you were a kid and you were convinced that there was going to be a man in a red suit slide down the chimney with a bag of toys and that they were, he was going to hop in his sleigh and go on to the next house. And that was your belief. And then all of a sudden, one day you, you saw your dad, you know, like mine did, you know, sneaking in the middle of the night, eating the cookies and the milk, uh, and then putting the presents under the tree. And then you said, oh, that wasn't the truth after all. So your identity and what you think about yourself on the tennis court is going to directly impact how you perform in the biggest moments. And so choosing an identity um, that is empowering, that allows you to play your best as a possibility to train into, I think is really, really valuable. So the 80-20 of 80-20 of identity is understand where you are now and where you want to go. And now you've got this gap that we can train into. All right, so now we've been through uh, the T, the R, the U, and the S of the trust system. And now we're going to talk about thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And, you know, we've talked about tennis not being a mental game, but ultimately everything starts with thought because the thoughts that you have are going to produce emotions. If you have a thought that says, that guy just cut me off in traffic, I am so angry. Or I can't believe my daughter forgot to pick up the flowers on the way home. You're going to experience a very definite emotion that's associated with that thought. And similarly, if you have a thought that says, gosh, I'm so in love with life right now, and tennis is such a beautiful game, you're going to experience very different emotions. Now, why is that important? Because if a thought is a stimulus and an emotion is a response, and we go back to Pavlov's dog, and you know, who had the steak, and they showed the steak and rang a bell, and they conditioned this dog to salivate every time that it saw the steak and heard the bell, eventually you can take the steak away and just ring the bell and the dog salivates. Well, it's exactly the same way with the way that you're thinking and feeling. And in fact, after a while, the thought that you have produces that emotion, and eventually you don't even need the thought to feel that emotion. It's just who you are. And if you're experiencing emotions like nervousness, and self-doubt, and overwhelm, and frustration, um, and a lot of the other emotions that I know a lot of tennis players are feeling on a regular basis, then those are going to directly influence um, the decisions that you make on the court. Whether you go for your shot, whether you trust yourself or not, those decisions are going to lead to the actions. You're going to get tight, you're going to miss, or you're going to go for it and make it. And those actions will influence your results. The more detached you are, the more loose you are, the more clear-headed you are, the better you'll play. 
And the more anxious, nervous, tight, and self-doubting you are, the more that's going to influence whether or not you pull through in the big moments. And those results that you get will influence the next set of thoughts. And those thoughts trigger the same emotions and on we go. So that's how we become self-fulfilling. That's how we develop these self-fulfilling prophecies. And in fact, the thoughts, feelings, and emotions directly impact your identity because your identity is nothing more than a series of thoughts, feelings, and beliefs that you've sort of memorized in your brain and in your nervous system. And let's talk a little bit about the nervous system, and then we're going to talk about how to actually change these because I think it's so valuable. In your um, thoughts, you produce emotions, and those emotions signal hormonal centers in the body um, that tell the body to release hormones, and those hormones allow us to feel within the confines of that emotion. And in fact, hormones that we find out signal genes epigenetically, and this is a new branch of science, we find out that it's the environment that signals the gene. And these genes make proteins, and proteins are responsible for the makeup and the structure of your body. So the thoughts and the feelings and emotions that you're having are literally reshaping the way that your body um, uh, performs on the court and a bunch of other things. So if you took a second and you became aware of the thoughts, feelings, and emotions that you experience on a regular basis throughout the course of a match— particularly a close match where the outcome is sort of uncertain. And you might have thoughts like, oh my God, here we go again. I can't believe I missed that shot. I need to practice more. I didn't have a good warm up. It's windy. It's hot. It's a bad call. They screwed me over again. And all of those thoughts that race through your mind, knowing that they all signal emotions and hormones in the body to feel those emotions, then we start to become aware of those thoughts and we can start to say, okay, these aren't actually the truth. These are just thoughts that I have just like, oh, Santa Claus is real. And so next to that column, if you had those thoughts and emotions, you could write down a new set of thoughts and emotions that you do want to have as the new you. And you could begin to decide what thoughts and feelings you do want to have in a tight match. I'm fully prepared. I'm as... You know, I've done all the training that I can up until this point. Um, I trust my processes, and we're going to be giving you processes that you can use, just like our players that have allowed them to win national championships, become the top players at their 3.0 social doubles on a Sunday, um, and everything in between. And now you can start to see how you have the old you and the new you, and now you've got this gap to train into. And it is the quality of your thoughts and emotions mixed with your ability to execute sound, proven, data-driven tactics repeatedly under pressure, and that is the trust system, that will allow you to reliably and predictably start beating players that you've always narrowly lost to, who are untrained, who are doing the same things as everybody else, who are hitting loads and loads of balls from the baseline in a relaxed environment, cross courts, down the lines, and then maybe they'll get and play some points. Well, we're going to train very differently because we're going to be training based on data and how data shows us that 70% of points are won in the zero to four shot rally length. And your ability to execute those first two shots and every other shot is going to be based on what Lenny's been talking about, which is what your eyes and head are doing during the point of contact, which is when 95% of the players out there are hitting blind. And so you can start to see how if we change the way that you train and we start to focus on the really big ticket items, the 20% of the 20% of the 20%, and we focus on those in exclusion to everything else or at least in a disproportionate amount of attention, then you should start to see feedback in your tennis matches. And you should start to see it pretty quickly because if we know that amateur tennis players are off balance in uh, 90% of the time in practice and are mishitting 80% of balls, which we do because the Billie Jean King study proved it, and we flip those numbers on their head and we restore perfect balance and we begin to execute solid hits 80% of the time and we combine that with data-driven tactics and two-shot combinations that we have trained repeatedly under progressively higher levels of pressure I would say that the the balance 
could possibly swing in your favor. Just throwing something out there. I don't know. We're making stuff up. We're not making stuff up. It's just a joke. We have, we have loads of testimonials that prove that this is possible, and you're going to be hearing from these people in the future. So to wrap up the trust system and the 80-20 of 80-20, so that you can begin to get disproportionate results compared to your peer group. Tactics, the 80-20, knowing those two shot combinations and really understanding from a tactical perspective where those patterns are and how to work those patterns into your training. The R of repetition, learning how to train so that you're on balance 90 to 100% of the time and you're mishitting only a fraction of the balls that you're hitting which we will talk about more in the future. And then you combine that with the pressure training and starting to layer in that pressure in every single practice, every single shot that you hit in training so that everything is accountable, so that you see yourself progressively hitting your marks in training over and over and over again, which feeds into your identity as a clutch player, not by wishful thinking, but by action. And how that influences the way that you think and feel and the emotions that you experience on the court, you can start to see how your future on the tennis court can be vastly different. Even if you're in your 60s or 70s, we've got people that are in their 80s that are doing unbelievable things. Even if you're not in the best of shape, we have people with degenerative hips that are um, 80 pounds overweight that are kicking butt and taking names. It doesn't matter who you are doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how long you may have been struggling in the past. We know the brain is plastic. It's neuroplasticity. And we can change the way that your brain is wired so that you can experience more and more clarity on the court so that you can become less distracted and so that you can experience more and more of those empowering emotions on the court and so that you can execute, so that you can detach from the outcome that you hear people talk about all the time, become totally process-driven, first of all, having a process and what that actually is, and then focusing on that process so that you can truly abandon your attachment to the results and all of that emotional baggage that comes with it that I know all too well, that you know too well. So, uh, this has been an amazing uh, conver- one-sided conversation. This is a recorded conversation. So if you're watching this on a replay um, and you have any questions about what we've covered so far, please feel free to put this down, uh, put them down in the comments. I'll be happy to uh, hang out and talk with you there. Um, and if you know anybody that uh, can benefit from the training that you watched today, uh, please feel free to share this with them, tag them in the comments. Our mission is to help tennis players get out of that loop of frustration between really not living up to what they know they're capable of and giving them a way, a pathway, that they can quickly start winning more tennis matches and improve in the process. Um, It is possible. We know it's possible. And in fact, we know a formula that works 100% of the time when you follow it that you'll hear more about uh, in the coming days. So thank you so much for watching this video. I had a great time making it for you. Um, I'm excited to be doing this more uh, with you. I feel like this is a a gift uh, that I get to experience with you um, and through you. And so thank you so much. Um, If you have any questions, put them down below, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the